All right, welcome back. You can see now we've got um, our ball. We're bouncing around. We're no longer using gravity. Um, but what we can't do is if we come to the speed value and we crank up the speed to see what kind of play we want. And even if we want to, you know, change the speed during the game, it's not reacting to that. Um, so what we're going to have to do in that case we're going to have to fix our script up a little bit. And we're going to leave this back at a nice descending 45 degree. What we're going to do here um, is we're going to check that the velocity is always within the tolerance of speed. All right. Now this is called once per frame, and I've discussed in previous vi videos though, the graphics engine isn't running at the frame rate of the game. It's running at its own internal fixed frame rate. So we're not actually able to do anything in update with the ball. That would be a mistake. We would be changing and checking the velocity in between physics calculations when the rest of the world isn't able to react, the rest of the game world isn't able to react, then we're going to cause all kinds of problems. So what we actually need to do is we need to add a method here called fixed update. Okay. And this fixed update, right, I'll just go ahead and make this look like a bug, is called once per physics update. Okay? So the fixed update is going to be called every time the physics engine updates. So this is the spot where if you're going to interact with the physics system, you want to make those changes. If you make them an update, you're going to cause problems for yourself. Um, this, is a, this is a Unity gotcha right here. Um, I wish they would sort of include that by default in the uh, template when they, when they, like, here's your initialization. This is once per frame and this is once per physics update. Okay. It runs at the fixed cycle of the physics engine. And if you're curious about all of this and how these interact and who's called first and who's called next and what the order is going to be on your Unity documentation, um, Let's go back to the documentation, and I'm going to search the manual for uh, life cycle. Um, partial rendering legacy. I you search for yeah. Give me just the um the big <laughs> uh, life cycle documentation. Execution, execution order of event functions. Okay. I like the word life cycle. Um, I did hit, it just was down at the basis. All right. All right. And this tells you what gets fired when, you know, awake, then on enable fires, then before the first frame updates. So start runs before the first frame. Okay, in between frames, on application pause, update order, fixed update gets run first, update gets run second, and then late update gets run even after update. Um, don't worry about light update right now, but fixed update runs before update. Okay, the order that we have them in our script doesn't matter, right? Unity is going to call if it's time to call fixed update, then it will call it before, um, excuse me, it will call it before update. So if we were to change the velocity and update, the physics happens right in between these two. All right, right there. Oops. Right there. That is the physics line. You have fixed update, then you have physics run, and then you have update. Okay? 
If we were to change the velocity, that would be after all of the physics calculations of collisions and bounces and new directions had run. Um, and it wouldn't be able to take advantage of any changes that we made into the physics uh, system. Now notice this here. Physics update is called more frequently than update. So I've been telling you like, hey, this runs at a slower rate than an update. What's going on? Uh, you've been wrong. Well, not really. Because remember I told you about the continuous and the, the dynamic and the, the uh, continuous dynamic. If you're going to do six steps of the physics engine, that means you're going to call fixed update six times. So if update's running at 60 frames a second. Physics is running at 30 frames a second. That means for every two updates, you're running one physics cycle, but one physics cycle is six updates. Because the solver count is set to six, it's going to break it into one sixth, right? So that is actually running six to two, um, probably on default. And when you can think of this by default. All right. And they talk a little bit about, um, don't need to use time delta time, et cetera, all these things. We'll get the time delta time and time fixed time and, and those things um, as we move on. I just want to point out that Unity, um, oops, excuse me, this Unity document on, and then there's a big flow chart. Oh, I, this, this is the flow chart we actually wanted. Can we zoom in? Um, wow, can you not give me a cool version of... All right, I'm trying to make it as big as I can here so you can see it. Um, it's, it's it's interesting the way their their flow of the page is working. Like the more I scale, the worse it gets. Um, you can see here physics. There's your fixed updates, internal physics updates. Things get triggered that collided and such. It goes back into the engine multiple times. Mouse events, input events, then updates called. Your game logic goes through, right? So this document here is really good to study sometimes just to understand, you know, when something's going to be called. For example, your on triggers and your collision events, when we get into those, they're running before our update statement. So we know that by the time we get to update, collisions and physics have been resolved. Okay. All right. So in our fixed update, what we really are all after is that the speed value that we set in start is being honored. Okay. I'm going to say if. The velocity magnitude, that's our speed. Right, and return the length of this vector is greater than speed or less than speed. Okay. Now, I could also be generous and, and allow a little slop in the, in there. Um, I could also, since I'm doing explicit, I could just say not equals. So I did it this way because you could write, you know, speed times 1.01. Okay. And then this speed times 0.99 and give it sort of a 1% each direction tolerance that it could be within just so that I'm not, if, if there's really small decimal changes going on, I'm not updating every um, physics update, right? I'm not making those changes. Um, but for brevity of code here, I'm showing you this. But for the brevity of code, I'll just go ahead with the really, really explicit version, which is the absolute check. Is something you don't want to do. 
why don't you want to do this? Okay, why why do you want to do this and not the not equals? Well, it comes down to computers are binary. They represent ones and zeros. The problem is, is that converting from ones and zeros to 10 base decimal, what we're used to counting in, when you start dealing with fractions of a number, it doesn't convert cleanly. So when you're dealing with floats, you may come up with a calculation that is 2.879. And I don't know off the top of my head, but let's say 2.879 is one of those numbers that doesn't convert cleanly to binary. So when the computer stores this number in binary internally in RAM, it doesn't become 2.87. It becomes 2.8. Seven zero 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 one. Okay, I just had to tweak it a bit to make it line up. All right, because there's no decimals in binary to work with. This is called the imprecision of floats. All right, if you've ever heard that. So by saying not equals, you may actually force an execution every single time because it's not storing properly a calculation or a result of something. We're kind of safe here, um, since if the number couldn't be stored, it couldn't be stored in speed either. I said kind of safe, because what if it went 001 in one of them, and 999 in the other, right? Like, they, they went differently um, when it had to sort of truncate the value of the number down. Um so to save yourself some heartache, you could do this and give yourself some slop space, right? And not worry about exact matching. Okay. Now that we got that, what we want to do is we want to set the velocity. We want to change the magnitude, but not change the direction. All right. There's the set here is going to take in x, y, and z. That's not going to help us out. That's going to be too hard. Right? What we really want to do is change this magnitude. Right? But see, this just says returns. That's not something you could set. That would be an error in code. If I tried to do that, velocity, magnitude, oops. Right? That's what I want to do. But you can see the little red squigglies is telling me, no, you can't, it can't be assigned to. Alright? It's read only. Because it's the result of a calculation. If you want to get really, really, um, deep into the weeds, because this is a result of a calculation, this is doing that calculation here and here. I don't know that I can guarantee that this got cached. Um, so I may want to like cache this manually myself before I you test it multiple times. It's not so much that I'm actually going to worry about it um, in this code. But since it's the result of a calculation, I can't assign it. I can't make it go backwards to the calculation and figure out what everything else should be. So what we have to do is this. We have to use our normalization trick. So we take the vector that is now normalized, which means whatever the length was, it's going to point in the same direction and have a value of 1, and we multiply it by speed, just like when we assigned it originally, right? So that sort of takes it back to 1 and then multiplies it back to the length that we want, thus guaranteeing it is always moving at the speed that we want, or close there enough in. We gave it some slop uh, that could do. But now while I'm running it, if I grab the speed and I crank it up, you can see it responds. And if I take the speed and I crank it down, you can see it also responds again. So we have a, a ball of speed now that we can control. And, you know, it's worth pointing out, we're still within the confines of the physics engine. The balance materials are all working correctly. Everything is adjusting and reacting because we're doing it within fixed update 
um, where we should. Like, I'm not going to be able to cause any more. I can set negative speeds. The physics engine does not like that. Okay? Does not like a negative magnitude. Doesn't quite know what to do with that. I mean, we can really make it fight um, its direction versus its magnitude. But Just we might be able to get this to break out. I'm gonna just keep going. There might be a point that we can still, even with our continuous collision detection, get it, get it, get it. It's going, it's going. But this would be an impossible breakout game to play. But it's just fun to play with this. And the reason you might want to jack the speed up to 921 is one, we're still running at 80 frames per second. Frame rate's good. That's unplayable. Two, our collision is good. We're not breaking out of anything. So we don't have to worry about normal gameplay causing us a problem. All right, let's break it. All right? You gotta be like Mythbusters. All right? You gotta, you gotta test the myth and then you gotta do what it takes to make it true. Um, look at all this. Wow. This sucker. Um, we might have at this point be running into Physics speed limitations. Because we're not even doing decimals anymore on the speed. I don't know if I can. It's unbreakable. Nope, we're in the scientific notation. We're good. I will call that a day. Notice when I stop, too, again? Back to eight. Back to normality. All right. So we have all that going. And that's wonderful. And that's great. It's time to put um, a paddle onto the screen and move it around a bit. So that we can interact with this um, with the player. And let's start this off as we start all objects off. With a cube. Let's bring the player down to, let's say, 9. 9 seems like a nice, negative 9 seems like a nice number. Uh, let's stretch the x value. Wow, the x really wants to jump. Um, 6, maybe 5. All right. I'm going to add a component here. Rigid body. Because we're going to be able to move this. Doesn't use gravity. Um, this will never rotate. We'll never allow it to rotate. And we want to freeze it in the Z orientation. Okay. Now I'm going to take the ball. And it's going down. We got a 45 degree start angle. So what's common in... And we're going to call this... Paddle. What is common in most breakout games, uh, if you go back and you, you play a Brick Breaker or you play uh, Breakout on the NES or, you know, any any Breakout clone, you'll notice they set up the first hit to always bounce off the paddle. Now, didn't like that, did we? Let's check is kinematic. Oh wait, I'm on the ball. Let's check is kinematic on the paddle. The ball is still checked. Hold on. Unchecking the is kinematic on the ball. I actually freeze the rotation of the ball in all directions. It doesn't need to rotate, it's just gonna bounce. Now there we go. Now because it is kinematic. We're getting the advantage of the physics engine for calculation purposes, right? But we're not taking the outcome of a physics collision on this object because it's a paddle. We don't want the paddle to be knocked into the ground like we just saw, all right? So when we come back in the next video, 
um, we're going to add some script to this guy so that we can control and move him. And we'll get to the Unity um, input subsystems as well.